Luxury writ large may be a quarter of a trillion dollar industry, but personal luxury only grew one to two percent last year. And the future, no one would argue, is one of unpredictable volatility. Thank you, Nader, for that. It's not just about politics and economic challenges. It's about a whole new consumer generation on the rise. And as any digital analyst or parent could tell you, they don't think like us, they don't interact like us, and they sure as hell don't shop like us. So I ask you, are we at a flexion point? If conventional wisdom and strategy don't change, if we don't go beyond product to talk about what goes into product and the value systems, abstract as they may be, that are associated with product, is the luxury empire at risk? Not if you think it is. Come on, someone not. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so what do we do about it? That's what we're here to talk about. And I'm very honored to introduce a woman who I think can bring extraordinary perspective to the question, the former global chief executive of Chanel, Maureen Chiquet. Um, I would also like to say, just before we start, that <laughs> we did not, in fact, coordinate our outfits this morning. One of those crazy things. Start close in. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing. Close in. The step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way of starting the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. I decided to start with this poem by David White. It's called Start Close In in part because I think given the tragedies of last November and the many tragedies around the world since, it is a time that has pulled us together to ask some deeper questions, both as individuals but also as a community. <laughs> and in so many ways, I feel like I am standing on the pale ground beneath my own feet, and this is really my own way of starting the conversation because I'm not standing here on behalf of any company or brand, as, as you heard, the former. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just here as myself, as a woman, as a luxury customer, as a merchant who once coveted the exquisite beauty of luxury from the outside, and as an executive who spent the better part of the last 15 years learning and grappling with the actual business of luxury <laughs> on the inside. So, I've come here today to share with you my questions, many that started out as personal, but have come now to shape a philosophy that I believe is critical to our industry as we face increasing macroeconomic challenges, currency fluctuations, growing geopolitical vulnerability, and even possible irrelevance to a brand new generation of consumers and of employees. So, as Vanessa said, I don't think any of us can deny that luxury itself is in the midst of a huge transformation. I mean, even an inflection point. I mean, I think it has been at least since around 2007. And I should know because that's the year that I was named CEO of Chanel. And it was just one year after YouTube was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. The first viral video, Charlie Bit My Finger. Does anyone remember that one? <laughs> well, it seemed harmless enough, but the eruption of user-generated content soon proved to be a real threat to the creativity and even the identities of artists and brands alike. Now, blogging had already shown us that anyone could have an opinion about anything. I mean, any customer can log a public complaint, any fashionista, could become a revered expert overnight. 
any disgruntled employee could tell the entire world just how mismanaged your company was. And this was before Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WeChat, Snapchat, Weibo, Glassdoor, that's just to name a few, and they're continuing to multiply. But the internet wasn't the only game changer. With increasing travel and developing economies, the world had suddenly become a truly global marketplace. While the 80s and 90s brought us an influx of Japanese tourists, the millennium ushered in record numbers of Chinese and other nationalities, all ready to line up around the block to get one of those coveted luxury logos. I mean, of course, I, we were all grateful for this booming business, and we opened up a lot of doors during that time, but ensuring the right level of service for both our long-term clients and so many new cultures, that proved really challenging. And this burgeoning demand ignited the already buoyant parallel and counterfeit markets. So if you really wanted to give yourself a good scare back then, all you had to do was type your brand name into any number of search engines and just wait for the unauthorized sites to multiply before your eyes. So I think while affording all of us great opportunities and tremendous growth, the internet and globalization were also undeniably wreaking havoc on one of the very premises of luxury itself, exclusivity. Okay, so here I am, this young, at the time, young, younger, let's say, American woman at, the, at a table of suits and ties, fresh from the mass market land of item of the week and $5 teas, arriving to run the most exclusive French luxury brand in the world. Now, I mean, I've, I've always loved France. The aesthetic, the food, of course, the wine, the wine. <laughs> I started my career, in fact, at L'Oreal in Paris. I married a Frenchman. I even speak fluent French. But in this new context, nearly everything that I had learned about how to run a mass market business, I had to now unlearn if I was going to be able to succeed and to prove that I could lead this very experienced, luxury-savvy team. To be honest, it was one of the most challenging periods of my life. I mean, you know, here I am, I'm supposed to be the one with, the, with all the answers, the one defining the winning strategy, forging forward and, and commanding the troops to best the competition. But I was the one with the most questions and the least certainty about how we were going to proceed. But soon, what I began to realize was that in the midst of such disruption, it wasn't just me who was in unknown territory. I mean, I wasn't the only one who was going to have to put away her reassuring five to ten year strategic plans and that reliable customer research or those tried and true historical precedents that had come to define our past success. It became clear to me, and more and more clear to me, that as a team, we were all going to have to find new ways to lead, new ways to think about our business as we considered what first steps to take into this interconnected, fragmented, uncontrollable, and ever-changing world without forsaking the beauty, the creativity, the exclusivity, and of course, the desirability of our brands. Well, thankfully, the world has just gotten so much less complicated since then. But in any case, I'd like to share with you some of what I discovered these past years about myself, about luxury, about what I believe are essential new leadership qualities to meet a world now demand demanding more from us as brands and as leaders than any other time in history. So, my journey started out in a pretty unexpected place. I, I wasn't around any boardroom table. I wasn't wandering through our boutiques or those of our competitors. I wasn't analyzing bar charts or 
consumer data or even working on our exquisite products or our ad campaigns. Instead, I found myself in the front row of a conference at Yale University, nearly spellbound, listening to Aung San Suu Kyi. Dasu, as she's known less formally, is none other than the fam famous Burmese leader who spent 15 years under house arrest for opposing the military dictatorship in her country. She now sits, as you know, as an influential member of Myanmar's parliament. So there she stood, this, this petite woman, with flower beautifully pinned in her hair, wearing a, a wonderful cream and bordered gown. And it struck me that as she told her story of fierce resolve and personal sacrifice to end corruption and secure democracy for her country, she was all the while boldly expressing her femininity, unabashedly radiating her beauty, and softly, yes, softly emanating her power. She didn't condemn the military or complain about her fate. She actually spoke of her adversary's humanity and how she, part she was partnering with them to improve living conditions in the country she so loves. She spoke of listening to them, of sitting in their shoes, of, of understanding their needs. And yet, she was never willing to compromise her vision or her values in her quest to take her country forward. So as I listened, it occurred to me that she embodied something very different than the command and control or authoritative method of leadership that we've all thought to be so effective. She actually had no true power or authority in the traditional sense. She did not get to call the shots, and actually pushing too hard to win or to have her way would have only really worked against her. Yet choosing to be collaborative, choosing to embrace her feminine side, to lead with empathy, humility, flexibility, proved not to be a handicap, but a powerful advantage. Now, I, I certainly did not have world peace at stake, uh, but coming into my first assignment as CEO, especially in such a time of uncertainty and chaos, I did have a lot of ideas about what I thought I needed to drive us forward and to gain my team's confidence and respect. I mean, I was always taught, you know, you have to be bold and focused, assertive, take charge, demand respect. And that's what had gotten me promoted in my last jobs, and this is what most corporations usually praise. Not many researchers and sociologists have coined these behaviors as masculine leadership strengths. And by the way, they are nothing short of vital to any good business. But that afternoon really helped me consider my own leadership in a broader way. Da Su had shown me a powerful example of their more feminine counterparts, things that had actually also served me in my career, but that now I needed to bring forward and into focus as we were entering this new context. Rather than trying to push my own plan or, or my point of view, I needed to listen deeply, listen to my team, assure them that I valued their experience, and try to find as much common ground as I could between their history and my observations as a newcomer with fresh eyes. I needed to value my curiosity and the questions that I could ask to open new thinking for all of us, not just the answers that I could provide. Instead of trying to put on a game face, pretend I knew everything, I had to be real. I had to be authentic in both my strengths and in my shortcomings. I mean, I had to be vulnerable, at times ask for help, or admit when I didn't know something, which was pretty much all the time in the beginning. And I had to be flexible, agile, open-minded in my approach. I mean, we were all looking at things daily that didn't even exist a year before and course-correcting with rapid speed. I mean, this is all the while adding the complexity of, of, of layers of organization, more people, 
more points of sale. So overall, I still needed to be strategic, determined, resolute. It was actually these so-called softer or feminine skills during this time that made me feel the strongest and the most resourceful, and that completely transformed my relationship with my team. Now, when I say masculine and feminine, this isn't really about gender. Aung San Suu Kyi happens to be a woman, but author John Gierzema in the Athena Doctrine and countless articles since have proven that many combinations of both masculine and feminine strengths can be present in any leader, man or woman. And in fact, he proves that many of the most effective and most transformative leaders possess a balance of both. Take Nelson Mandela, another great example. So I didn't actually know that anyone was doing research about this at the time, but what I did realize was that what I was learning about myself could have much broader benefits for all our leaders and our culture as we struggled to adapt both, both individually and collectively to such new and accelerating demands. So now you're probably asking yourself, okay, Maureen, what does this have to do with luxury beyond product? But if you think about our current challenges and the many ways that we have been pushed outside of our comfort zone of authority and our reliance on the past as an industry, we all need to listen better to our customers, to the world around us, and especially to our teams, which are increasingly filled with a whole new generation of employees. We have never had more diverse cultures, more diverse clients. Millions of people all over the world are sharing information about our products, about our brands, about our companies daily. And these younger generations of both customers and employees, they're expressing very different values. And they're making it clear that we're going to have to appeal to them in a radically different digital economy, where, by the way, brands, are increasingly the least, sources tr so least trusted sources of information. I mean, take what's going on in China right now. I'm sure you've read the recent women wear, Women's Wear article about social commerce, where customers are now not just looking to social networks to communicate, to share, but also to purchase their products. And yet, we need to listen without drowning out the intelligence on the inside, the heartbeat of our brands. We need to investigate and mine the gems of our brands to best determine how they, stay tr how they stay true to a core purpose, our core purpose, while embracing the future. Which means we're also in a time that demands our complete authenticity, not just in the products we make, but in everything that we do. Differentiation has never been more elusive. New brands, copies, fakes, continue to come out of the woodwork, and the internet has only increased their exposure and provided them also a very inexpensive way to show and sell their products. So what is the one thing that nobody can copy or take away from you? We all need to be more open-minded. We're not just in competition with each other anymore. The appropriation of luxury is being stretched in multiple sectors. I think we all know this. And the word luxury has come to mean entirely new things. I mean, take Volvo, who in their last ad campaign made a luxury out of simplicity, sanctuary, and confidence. Or the many travel brands who are making a luxury out of time and convenience. What's precious in this world is shifting and we need to be able to open the aperture to see outside our industry. We all need to be more agile, more flexible. Things continue to change daily, and flexibility beco becomes paramount when you have no idea what the next day is going to bring. I mean, just think about how many new internet platforms were created last year alone, or the impact of so many terrifying events in our major cities in the last months. We all need to take a look at our vulnerabilities. 
or we could get blindsided in this global fishbowl of transparency. Any misstep, any possible flaw, any error could be known and spread around the world in just minutes. I mean, if you don't believe me, I'll remind you what happened to Volkswagen not so long ago. There is no question that we need to be more collaborative. With this kind of rapid interconnectivity, we have to be in careful lockstep around the globe to ensure brand consistency and alignment of our messages and our teams. I mean, getting people to work together across more time zones, cultures, generations than ever before requires a lot more than just authority and clear direction. Perhaps most importantly, we need to be more self-reflective, really consider fundamentally who we are, not just what we offer our clients, but why we're here, why we do what we do, and how we can do it better. And this does go beyond the sheer beauty and desirability of our products. Our clients are seeking even higher quality, even more unique designs, but they also want more meaning and connection in their purchases and during their purchases. They may still want the badge of success or to show that they're hip or they're in the know, but now they may also want them to say what a unique or a conscious person they are. I take a look at a brand like Nike, always evolving, but always staying true to its core promise that everyone is an athlete. Now, I know you'll be discussing logos uh, later on, um, and I was thinking about this for Nike. I mean, I've actually never seen a Nike product without a logo. Sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller, but in a way, we don't mind, because that logo is imbued with something that we care about, something that we identify with. And the need for these feminine qualities is only going to intensify as millennials, soon to be 50% of our population, continue to gain power and drive the digital economy. This is a generation that values authenticity, collaboration, contribution, and participation, both as consumers and as employees. They will make purchase decisions and accept job offers from companies whose ethics and values they endorse. And they insist on transparency. They want to purchase when, how, and where they want. And by the way, they're going to make it happen even if we don't. I have to tell you, having spent a lot of time with younger employees and having been harassed by my own two daughters about my plastic water bottle usage and my fur coats, they are influencing other generations too, and I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. So when I consider the gravity of these shifts, the undeniable power and need for these qualities in 21st century business, I feel we're not just talking about expanding our leadership frame here, but expanding the very paradigm of luxury itself. I mean, it's a paradigm that's been expertly crafted around heritage, artisanship, creativity, exclusivity, rarity. I mean, these are all really important things. We, we talk about these things, we, we all market to them. And it's our tried and true formula, and it's been successful long before probably any of us in this room. But there are companies stretching the very definition of, of luxury by tapping into something slightly different, and they're growing. Last year, Tesla sold far more of their top model than either Mercedes or BMW, historically the best-selling luxury cars. Now, Tesla offers undoubtedly a beautiful product with exceptional design and unparalleled innovation. But relatively speaking, they're a brand new company. I mean, they don't have that pillar of heritage that most of us think is so important. Now, I can't pretend to know all the reasons why they're so successful, but I have to wonder if, given the choice, consumers are opting for cars that look just as good and feel just as good, maybe better, but also help them contribute, contribute to lowering the CO2 emissions. Apple. Apple was rated the number one luxury company in China. 
Now, I think the iPhone is anything but rare. It's practically ubiquitous. And Apple has completely changed the rules in their advertising. Instead of showing us beautifully curated images by a professional photographer, they've invited us, their customers, to submit photos with their iPhone 6. I think this idea compromises nothing on the beauty or on the strength of their brand, but in fact, it makes it stronger by inspiring us and inviting us to participate. And speaking of participation, I do have one personal example. I love going on safari. Um, I've been to many of the luxury lodges in Africa, and let's just say I have a super high bar. I'm, I probably in a past life could have been a hotel critic, as I'm sure some of you could as well with the kind of travel that we do. But um, last year, I decided to visit a lodge that was recommended by some of my friends, in addition to one of my very, very favorite small chains. And it's interesting because while both of the, the places were five-star res five resorts, great wine, I seem to talk a lot about wine, but great wine and food and service, the chain was actually arguably a cut above on those strict amenities, the luxury KPIs. In fact, almost to a point of clinical expertise. Yet the lodge, recommended my, by my friends, it's called Londolozzi, proved to have a few things that weren't just rare, but truly priceless. I took this photo from about 15 feet away from this mother leopard and her cubs, and no, I didn't take it with my iPhone 6. I wish I had, because then I'd have one of those billboards too. Um, <laughs> but all, uh, I, I know all safaris have great photo ops, and I've been on a lot of them, but I have never encountered anything like the trust or the comfort of these animals at Londolozzi. I mean, what's more rare or luxurious than that? This leopard not only trusted us enough to sit with her, she actually called her cubs out of hiding and bathed bath them within just meters of our truck. And in so many ways, this moment was actually representative of Londolozzi's ethos and what makes them so special. They've developed harmony with the land, with the communities, even the animals, amongst their clients and their staff. The service was anything but clinical. It was about a relaxed friendship, but nonetheless professional. Our stay there contributed to food and a thriving learning center for the local community, and they're revolutionizing the operating system of the bush by procuring more land to build a rhino refuge. Oh, and by the way, they do rent lenses. They have this thing called a creative hub where you can come and foster your own creativity and work on your pictures and memories. Londolozzi has an ethos of harmony that they claim as a value and as a purpose. It shapes not only their core product, Safari, but everything that they do. And they go beyond service, just the way Apple goes beyond advertising. And there's a reason that their return bookings are doubling over last year's, just like there's a reason that Apple and Tesla are on the rise. They are finding ways to connect and to do business that are both, both representative of today's values and true to who they are. And I firmly believe that whatever we do to meet this younger generation or in this digital age or in this crazy new world, whether it's highlighting artisanship protecting the environment, supporting cultural or social good. It can't just be a top-down mandate. It can't be some kind of screw-on solution or an appropriated cause uh, or the next trend from some kind of market research. It has to start close in, in the words of my friend David White. It has to start with shifting the behaviors and the mindsets of leaders first and having led a significant cultural revolution to explicitly teach, practice, and incorporate these values, these values at multiple leadership levels and into business practices, I can tell you that this is actually at the root of any long-term sustainable change or evolution. When leaders are challenged and supported to be more open and authentic, 
to look at their deeper motivations and their fears, to listen to their adversaries. When leaders are pushed outside of their comfort zones through disruptive thinking and explicitly encouraged to experiment and to try new things. When they're supported to create communities with genuine connection and shared purpose, then meeting this new world, uh, incorporating these feminine qualities, begins to shape itself, not just from the top down, but from the inside out. And as much as these traits aren't really sy synonymous with gender, I do believe that when companies are able to put feminine leadership traits on an equal footing with already successful masculine traits in terms of what they explicitly value in their leaders. More diverse and more women leaders will be able to truly succeed. And given that luxury happens to be an industry 85% driven by women and yet has a dearth of women leaders at the top, it's at least something to consider. So I'd like to close by offering you one more stanza of David White's poem. Start right now. Take a small sip you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Thank you. <laughs>